especially don't say anything awful about the former government or anything like that, all right? Or, or your parent-in-laws or, or your kids. Uh, as soon as one person jumps in, I'll run the video. So it usually takes about a minute, Sandy. Um, I might say, Sandy, you had the most likes on on anything I've ever posted, except for <laughs> except for a mural. So, really? Wow! Yeah, I got hundreds and hundreds for a mural that I posted, um, but this was uh, this was amazing. So wow. let's see. Let's see. Yeah, I got a lot of notifications from that. Yeah, yeah I was yeah. for a second I was like, what's happening? I didn't post anything. <laughs> oh right. wait. It's Sandy. <laughs> That's right. It's all Sandy. So, <laughs> so we'll so we'll find out if um uh if it, if it's everyone just jumping on the bandwagon or if they're uh, uh or if they're getting involved. All right. Did say quarter past. We're past that. Nobody's jumped in yet. So I'm going to run the countdown and let's get let's get started. It's the bird emergency. I'm Grant Williams. I am a bird nerd. It's Photography Friday, and in Photography Friday, I am an absolute rank beginner. I will be dispensing no advice. But that's good, because today we're going to be talking a lot about feelings. And we've got a special guest who can uh, tell us a lot about how photography um, has been a sort of bolstering factor in their life. But first, regular co-host joins me, Nicholas Rakatapare. Good I morning. Nick? How are Hi. you? Good, how are you? Really great. And there we go. We've brought in the surprise guest as well, Sandy Horn. Now, Nick, first with you. You're in the Gold Coast at the morning. You've been telling us that the weather is smashing you. So maybe mm. that will give us some uh, uh, NBN dramas. But tell us what's going on in the Gold Coast at the moment. Uh, well, there's a bit of a low pressure system off the east coast. So anywhere between uh, north and north New South Wales and around Townsville, they say it's pretty pretty windy. We're copping some massive rain showers. But yeah, the, the wind is pretty pretty off the charts. It's giving me some some memories of like sleeping through cyclones and things in uh, in Madagascar. But yeah, I got woken up a few times with all the, the windows rattling pretty loudly last night. They are very old windows, but... Yeah, it's a it's a, it's it's a wild weather. So I hope that there's a pair of bubuk that I visit a lot. And uh, after the last sort of wild weather, they've changed their day roost area because it's completely broken down from like branches falling down. So I'm curious to see. I hope they're fine, but I'm curious to see what they do this time. You'll have to get out and uh, and and track them down. Now, if you're a first time viewer for Photography Friday, it's our occasional look at bird and wildlife photography in general. Uh, we do talk a bit of gear, so for gearheads, you're going to get a bit of that. But we sort of focus more on uh, why people like the photography they do and well, how it makes it how it makes all of us feel warm and fuzzy stuff. Um, Nick is a professional photographer as well as a wildlife scientist. I'll leave that out there in in general terms. We won't peg that back too much. You can go back to the last episode and learn Nick's story. But the reason we're here today is to talk to Sandy Horn, who is up there in the corner, sitting in Adelaide. And Sandy, I invited you on. Welcome, by the way. But I invited you on because you've been posting photos into social media. Your Flickr album is great to poke around. I've been lucky enough to have the... <laughs> Uh, opportunity to do that but you've built up quite a fan base 
uh, on Twitter and you are really generous in what you post and you're really generous in what you share about your photography journey in general. So welcome, thanks, and tell us what is going on in Adelaide. Is it anywhere near what's going on in the Gold Coast? Hi, Grant. Hi, Nico. Um, it's grey and cold and I'm going stir crazy because I haven't been properly burning for, it seems like, forever. But I hope to remedy that tomorrow. Tomorrow's forecast to be quite nice. So I'm going up to see my peregrine falcons uh, if the weather cooperates. But hasn't been a lot of photography from me lately. Um, and I need to get out for my own mental health, really. Well, we'll get, we'll talk about mental health in a, in a short while. And hey, we're not doctors, all right? So, you know, <laughs> but Sandy, first, I wanted you to tell us about this photo. Um, why would I have picked it? Why is it important? This photo has been shortlisted in the current Australian Geographic Nature Photographer of the Year competition. And I was absolutely thrilled to have it picked. Uh, but I nearly didn't submit it. It was, I took it just before submissions closed early this year. And uh, I only submitted it because it was very popular on Twitter. I put it up on Twitter and people just loved it. So at the very last minute, I threw it in, in the urban animals category, thinking it won't get anywhere, but let's give it a go. And they rejected all of my other photos, which were carefully chosen, but picked up on this one. And I think people love it because people relate to it. Um, I find on social media the birds that people respond to are those that they're very familiar with. So galahs, any sort of cockatoo, kookaburras, magpies are always really, really popular. Um, so I was pleased they chose this one, even though oh, I, I'm, I'm surprised, but I'm pleased. Well, of course, Sandy, I've picked it and was really hoping to talk about it a little bit because uh, I do the Monday with Holly fortnightly and the focus of that is urban birds, the birds mm. that um, that we live with every day. So tell us about this magpie. Where is he? Oh, uh, well... Actually, uh, it's, it's a she, I think, isn't it? It's 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 the female. They're, where I used to live in Auburn in the Clare Valley, we had a pair of magpies that used to hang around. They were the resident pair of magpies. So we got to know them and their personalities quite well. And of course, this was a hot day in January. Um, and this was quite common. We'd put the sprinkler on for the birds to enjoy. And I was sitting out there, um, you know, taking a few snaps. But I think this one really captured the sheer joy of, of the bird enjoying the, the water. Um, it's a really common um, image to me it's a really familiar image to me um but uh yeah I, I think many australians can relate to it yeah uh, did you take a lot of pictures of this bird sort of in this sequence before yes you this one out yes i had it set on high speed continuous uh probably at a speed of 25 hundredths of a second i think from memory um, so, uh, you know, you know, spray and pray is what they say. You take a lot, you take a lot of shots and, you know, one or two is bound to be okay. Um, but this, this was the one that spoke to me. She's, she's got her eyes closed and she's really into it. Yeah. Um, birds and sprinklers, uh, untold joy just watching birds and sprinklers. Mm. Now, Sandy, I'm assuming you took that photo with that camera. Yes, that's my main birding body. I bought that back in October last year for my 60th birthday. Um, and, of course, I'm actually still learning how to use it. I keep finding new settings on there. Uh, but the really impressive thing about it is its eye-tracking technology. I don't always use it, but when I do, it just it blows my mind how it maintains focus on birds' eyes in flight. Um, it's incredible. Nico, J 
just as a recap, you're a Canon, you're a Canon fellow as well. What's your body, Absolutely. your main body? Uh, I have a, a Canon R three as of two weeks ago. That's right. So, that's so my first. That's my first done. camera with that specific with that specific eye tracking as well. Yeah. And uh, so until then, I had regular DSLR. And uh, the first time I tried, uh, it wasn't that one. I've I've been testing mirrors like the R five, the R six. And, uh, and and the other R cameras and some other uh, mirrorless brands as well. But that eye tracking that Sandy is uh, mentioning, when I first tried it uh, about two years ago, a year and a half on the R5, um, yeah, it's, my first reaction was like, this should be illegal. This should yes. be, it's just too easy. It's just people yes. that start with a camera that does eye tracking will never understand the, the difficulties of focusing on the bird in flight when you have three autofocus points. Um, no, it's, it's absolutely awesome. Yeah, it's, it's great yeah. technology. In fact, I got some advice from Nico before I bought that camera. I was tossing up between the R5 and the R6 and I decided the R5 is quite a bit more expensive and I couldn't justify the extra expense. I would have if I'd been doing a lot of video, but I don't do a lot of video, so I've been quite happy with the R6. We might talk about um, choosing a camera a little, probably right towards the end, because I'm going through that, um, the whole... FOMO and uh, FUD, fear, uncertainty, doubt, and the fear of missing out and budgeting, uh, all those decisions are happening with me at the moment. And, uh, oh, oh, is that Louie? Oh. Can you guys hear that? No, I that, can hear. That's, yeah. that's got to be a Gold Coast bird. What was that? No, wasn't here. I've got a magpie at the front of yeah. my oh, house a, right that's, now. Yeah, that's a that, that's a young magpie then. Uh, oh, I've got about twenty of them that hang around here. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, because that that doesn't sound like my magpies. And, <laughs> and if, yeah. for those of you who are overseas, uh, when we talk about the magpie in Australia, we're talking about this, but Sandy's got the blackback magpie, the the version of the Australian magpie which is significant, quite different looking to the magpie I have, which is the whiteback version. Um, and my magpies are very bold and um, they sing more than squawk, um, whereas I would have said that, that that one we just heard, Sandy, was a squawker. Um, so that, that they are quite different in the geographic areas. They have different songs, slightly different behaviours. So there we go. That's Louis. Ah, Louis. That's Louis. This Tell is what started, Louis. yeah, this this little guy started me on my interest in birds. So back in 1984, he flew into where I was working at a printing company and he was clearly exhausted and somebody stuck a basket over him and we all looked at this really pretty bird thinking, what is he? Nobody knew anything about birds. As it turned out, I took him home. Uh, to look after him because he wasn't in a good shape. Uh, we had no idea what he was. So we called him Louis the lorikeet, thinking he was a lorikeet. That's how ignorant I was. Uh, as it turns out, he's a Port Lincoln parrot and he was clearly an Avery escapee. He's not native to this part of Adelaide. Um, so uh, Louis was actually a pet for us for more than 30 years. I had no idea it was going to be such a huge commitment. Uh, and he moved into state with us. He, he, has, he lived in first Adelaide, then Melbourne, Sydney, back to Adelaide. So planes, trains and automobiles. Um, and he could whistle the 1812 overture. Uh, so he was, he was full of character, amazing bird. So I've got a real soft spot for all the Australian ringneck parrots uh, because of that. Uh, but he, he died a few years ago, unfortunately, but uh, always happy memories of Louis. And so that got me started uh, learning about parrots in particular and then later more birds. So that's where the bird journey started for me. And it's been a, a journey that you have been really willing uh, to share with, with everybody through social media. But before I we... loved it. I love doing that. I love... I love taking people 
you know, not everyone can get out like I do into these remote areas to get these shots. And if I can share that with people, it's it's a real it's a real privilege. And if I can teach people along the way, it's 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 a nice thing to do. Nico, I mentioned when we were doing the intros that Sandy was really generous with what she shares. And I wanted to get your thoughts on on that comment and my view that a lot of people who could be furthering at, at a time where we really need more people to understand and care about what's just beyond our, our local uh, neighbourhoods, the, the wildlife that is out there. A lot of people are only putting material out if there's a profit, if there's a benefit in it for them. And Sandy doesn't do that. So I was wondering if, if, if you think it, it, it is the main way of thinking for professional photographers who are going on expeditions, going to places that most of us will never journey to as part of their work, that they don't share a, you know, a shitload, for want of a better, better term, of their material. I don't think, again, at least in my experience and with all like my friends in that uh, in that sort of industry and area, it never it never stems from um, a, a place of not not being willing to share a lot because it doesn't because of like money options. You know, it's it's because we're talking to specifics here, people that do like expeditions and things, and and often you have you you do that on a for a, an assignment, a magazine, a client, something. So there are there are things along uh, along that way that reduces sort of like what you will be sharing early on or afterwards. Um, I don't think I don't see that with a lot uh, of my uh, like of my colleagues, contacts, acquaintances, and friends that uh, people would be reluctant to share. I think the the the, the more uh, the, the the more the, the reason I see more often is um is that the time it takes on the to 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 consistently share on a, on social media to to share a lot of it. So some people also have a very particular. Book about uh, about what they share as well and uh, same i don't i don't post a huge amount uh, i would say on the on the scheme of things but uh i just um, it's just sort of person preference I, I, i'm very picky about what i think i like or like very picky with myself and i think like some people are like that as well so no i don't think it's really uh, it comes down to like a, a sort of like a monetary thing that people don't want to share because uh, they prefer keeping things form um, that, that that will make money or anything i think it's a there's a like bigger factors that that decides uh, what to how people are sharing yeah what uh, one thing i had um really thought was going to be a limiting factor for people sharing is time because social media mm. takes a lot of yeah, time. Yeah, it does. To do, it does. To do Making caption, that. choosing the image, resizing for the right things. It's constantly changing. One day you have a six by a nine, the next they change to a four by five. You have to recrop the photos if you want to put them back in that format. And um, and 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 some, one thing that every social media platform like loves, and uh, and uh, every algorithm love is is a uh, consistency and posting a lot. And um, and uh, and that takes a lot of time, a very like a lot of time. So, thanks, Stan. You you saw Stan on Kangaroo Island. Mm -hmm. Just give yeah. us a, a, a nice comment. I'm glad you're um, finding it worthwhile, Stan. That's good. Um, Sandy, we might just have a quick look at your other main lenses uh, mm -hmm. before we go into some of the things you just mentioned. So. That's your sort of standard that's, main lens, yeah? Well, that's my wide angle. So I use that for landscapes. Um, so often when I go out birding, I'll have my main long lens around my neck, but I might have uh, my spare camera off my shoulder, either with the landscape, the wide angle lens or the macro lens, because you never know when you're going to bump into an interesting insect or an orchid or a spider. Uh, so I always like to have that option that if the birds aren't happening, there's always something else to take a photo of. That's that's my old camera, my 7D. Oh, that, okay, so that's 
So that's what, what I've marked as your backup camera. But that's actually, spare, yeah. But, but that's your spare camera there. That's your macro that the... and landscape, which is the, uh, that's the EOS uh, R. That's an R, no. I believe. Yeah. Sandy has an RP. Yes, not quite that one. Similar. Okay. Okay. Well, that's that. That's Wikipedia and Google letting me down <laughs> again when I I search yeah. for one that I'm allowed to use. Uh, yes. So you uh, so you've got. Uh, let, let's pretend this is the right one. Yes. That would be your macro, your yeah. macro one, which you are using with the wide angle lens. Yes. Yes. Or okay. or the macro lens. Uh, which. Uh, is, I'll. Which is not that, that one. one. Oh, it is that, that one. Okay, yes. I've got that one. Right. Okay. So I'll, I'll quite often have that in my backpack just in case. Um, and it's it's also good to have a backup just in case your main camera fails for whatever reason. Now, that's a 100mm lens? Yep. Yep. So tell us what the main features are of that oh. lens and why you oh. uh, not, not not the text but why, <laughs> yeah. but why why is that a good one for 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 how you use it and is there any one of is there any of the pictures that you recommended to me that you took with that lens i i don't think i did I share any of my macro shots no. but uh okay i'll i'll add some to the web page yeah we publish the episode because um, uh, you do have a macro folder in your in your Flickr, so I, I I just have that on standby in case anything interesting comes along. Flowers, uh, for, in, for instance, uh, yeah, uh, fungi. Recently, I was up at uh, Altona Landcare in the Bross Valley a couple of weekends ago, and I saw these little teeny tiny um, uh, fungi, Lacaria. So there I was flat out on my belly in the mud with my macro lens trying to get some shots of these. And, of course, you've got to take lots of shots with different focal lengths so that you can stack them to get a really good end result. So it's, it's a really tedious process. It takes a lot of time and energy. But, you know, sometimes it turns out really well. And I do that with orchids too. It's coming up to orchid season now. So tomorrow I hope to get up to Spring Gully Conservation Park uh, where I hope to find a few nice orchids to photograph, as well as birds. Now, I'll, I'll just um, note that we, we have got this uh, comment. I'm, we're going to be talking about Panasonic Lumix stuff in a different show. We, we've got the Canon crew on, uh, on at the moment. I'm going through that whole process at the moment. I want to get. I want to purchase Micro Four Thirds, so I'm doing the Panasonic Olympus, blah 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 blah. So, yes, we'll be talking about that in a future episode. Um, I might just, I might just bring up why why I am looking at Micro Four Thirds rather than um, going for a rig like like yours, Sandy. Um, one of the main reasons is I've got a project which I'm working on for next year, which will be sort of a low impact, low carbon birding project where I travel as far as I possibly can with an e-bike. Now, obviously, I love your, your big lens, <laughs> Sandy, but I don't want to carry anything that big and that heavy. So Micro Four Thirds gives me the option to achieve similar results, yes, with something like that, without having to uh, carry one. So, um, well, well, while you had that up, Sandy, let's yeah. let's talk about that lens. Uh, how often, uh, how often are you shooting with that? What do you mean? How how many days a week, or? No, no, no. If if you're out and you take, let's say you take two thousand frames, right? Yes. A, uh, uh, um, and we'll have a look at some shots in a minute. Would most of them be with that, with that lens and and that camera body? Or yes. Would, yeah. Okay. Yes, so, I give it a. What is that it, lens on the on the photo? Sorry to inject the the photo. That's not your lens. 
no, no, no. That's that's one I got from Wikipedia, and that was from a a a, a public observatory in okay uh, in Hong Kong with that lens, and it's where okay. people in in an office building come and and look probably into the next office building by the look. Of it. I was wondering. Yeah, I just wanted to. Yeah. I was confused. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so. Uh, I mean, I try very hard because we're doing photography stuff. If I'm using images, yeah, it has to be the right. Yeah, yeah, I was just do the right thing. So wondering. all the credits, by the way, all the credits for all the photos on the web page are going to be down there if you want to check out <clears> and see all the uh, uh, all the people's flickers and and all that kind of stuff. So I get from- I get a I get a lot of comments from people when I've got this around my neck. Uh, people like to come up and talk to me and. Different types of people ask different types of questions. Oh, there I am. Um, but there you the... are again. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my son visited recently. He lives in America. And I, I, I took it birding. <laughs> I didn't I was, really get the story for that one. I because... was n- Look, we, we were up at Yakka, which is a tiny little town north of here. And we saw a... Mally Ringneck in the tree and I positioned the car so I could get a shot from the car and I leaned across my poor long-suffering son and took those shots and I didn't have any idea he was actually taking photos of what was going on and it was just hilarious so I, I smooshed him in the face with my camera but he didn't seem to mind too much. Um, Fortunately he likes birds too. Um so- but, uh, yeah, but I get lots of people talking to me. Um, but the best one was I was at Port Germain Jetty not so long ago and this this teenage boy ran up to me and he was, wow, that's a big lens. And then typical kid, how much was it? You know, no adult would ask you that, but the kids are just so honest. How much did it cost? He was just interested in the price of it. So. It's a lot, isn't it? Sam? It's a lot. <laughs> I, I told him it, it's actually worth more than my car. Yeah. So. No, uh, so that's another thing which I think is really great with your approach, Sandy, is that um, you've obviously invested a lot in photography, which indicates it's very, very important to you. It's not your job, right? No. But- uh, I'm not a professional. I'm not an expert. There are huge gaps in my understanding of technical stuff. I have a Monday to Thursday real job. This is my hobby and my passion and my therapy. Um, And, of course, it it does cost a lot of money, but I've gradually built up to this stage. Uh, And, of course, people have all sorts of hobbies. People have boats that cost a lot of money. Uh, You know, joining sporting clubs, that costs a lot of money. So... um, uh, and it brings me so much satisfaction that I really don't mind uh, buying this gear because I, I know I get my money's worth out of it. Well, now we've come to the to the fun bit. Um, if you want more gear talk, we will come back. I've got some specific questions about about gear, but Sandy, this is uh, a picture of something which you just referenced a little bit before ah yes my program falcons um i had a very lucky meeting when i was at spring gully conservation park uh i started chatting to some people i was there actually there are peregrine falcons at spring gully so i was there trying to get shots but i didn't have any luck and i was chatting to a couple there and they said well why don't you come to our farm? We've got peregrine falcons. So I was there the next weekend, no doubt. They have a disused quarry on their farm and they have this pair of peregrine falcons. Um, And so I visit, I'm free to visit whenever I wish, but of course you have to be pretty careful with these birds. They really don't appreciate um, any interference. Uh, Of course, it's a working property and the owners of the property go up to the quarry all the time. So they're actually used to seeing people around. Uh, My visits there are typically really short. Uh, If I think I'm upsetting the birds, I just leave. 
they're very intimidating. If they don't like you there, they will let you know and chase you off the property. Um, and it depends what time of year you go there, uh, how how willing they are to have you around. Um, I'm heading up there tomorrow. I'm going to set up my camera trap up on the top of the quarry because we're coming up to breeding season now and I'm hoping to get a few shots um, remotely. Uh, that's my camera trap. Um, uh, we'll come back to that, uh, but I just wanted to let yeah. people know that we, we have that. Um, yeah. But it's been interesting. They had a clutch of two babies which fledged. Uh, that's one of the babies just after it fledged. Um, and, of course, that's the time when you have to be especially careful. And that's specifically why I bought um, my two times extender, which I have here. That's it. Um, that allows me to get close to the birds without getting, that's it, without getting physically close to the birds. Uh, this is really heavy and it's not real cheap. But, uh, and of course, it's not ideal. I don't use it a lot, but it, because it messes up your settings in a big way. Um, so it changes everything. Um, and you've got to adjust for it. So, so I, how, that how far, was it. How far away were you uh, I, from the birds approximately when you took that shot? I can't, I don't know about distance. I can't measure distances. I don't know, but quite a distance. Um, but with my two times extender, I was able to get in a bit closer with my shots without upsetting the birds. Um, so that was the whole plan. I mean, I could get much closer to these birds if I wished, um, but they would not like that. They would not tolerate that. And I don't want to risk scaring them away because this quarry is like, um, uh, it's like the perfect environment for peregrines. Uh, I really don't want to interfere with what's going on. So um, this time of year, it should be okay. They should tolerate me. They don't have any young. They don't have any eggs. So I should be able to go up to the top of the quarry without too many problems. But I'll get up there, set up the camera trap and get out really quickly. Um, I might get some shots if they're around. They might be off hunting. I don't know. They're usually there. Nico, um, rem remember all the things we didn't get to talk about in the last episode? Um, mm -hmm. That was really... That really is part of that set of issues, isn't it? How close should you get to birds going about their own daily business, doing their own thing, uh, in order to not affect their behaviour? So, Nico, do you use extenders in your in your work very often? Yeah, uh, I've until like very recently. My my main uh, my main so the wildlife photography setup was a 300 2.8 with a times two extender, and uh, and I had that on my uh, on my uh, on my 7D Mark II for a long time, and then on my 1DX, so I'd lost a bit of like um, reach with uh, going to the full frame. But that's on the on the 7D Mark II. It was that would have been um, yeah around just shy of a thousand millimeter all the time, which is quite a mm -hmm. quite a big focal length. But um, and so I do use my extender a lot. I have lots of discussion about extenders, not necessarily on the ethics side of things, but uh, a lot of people are scared of using them because of uh, because of quality, like loss of quality, loss of light, and the things. So it's always very uh, very interesting. But um, the, to to me, like the the because every context is different, you know. Like in the in um when I when I walk around here, there is a little uh, there's a little marina just around the corner where I often like walk in the in the, in the evening, and there is a family of uh, um, superb ferrans there, and uh, they just sit on the railing as I walk by. The birds are literally two meters away from me, and uh, there is absolutely no they're so used to have people walk around. So I think often yeah, it's a, it's a very context based in terms of like uh, how close and and what like what you can and kind of things like that. Birds that come into your backyards are often more used to that. But if you're out in a national park, things will be way more wary, and that's where you try and avoid 
being uh, being too close and disturbing. Yeah, as Sandy said, if you have if you see sign of distress, you just shouldn't shouldn't uh, shouldn't shouldn't continue. And they always use you know the, the longest possible focal length that, that you can that you can have to try and even for the you know the it's it, the the welfare of the animals. It's not just the birds, but the welfare of the animals you're photographing is foremost all the time yes. in, in everything whether it's for your hobby work as a professional that that's something that we just uh we just stand by it's just it's just what it what it is but um but uh, yeah there is again like a little bit of a little bit of a uh, context uh context to that absolutely like i said you know a, a bird in your backyard that you see every day versus uh, something that's less used to people things in parks in australia would come so i think yeah, the, the distance really isn't the, the, the determining factor here because it's still contact in space it's really um like respecting the the the, the boundaries that the, the the animal sets for you yep. sandy yeah. um you mentioned that the bird this pair of peregrines will let you know if they're not happy that they mm. sort of I'm, I'm assuming they do the dive bombing and, and yes and, and hunt you off um did you when you took this shot? Did you have the extender on on your big lens? No, this was one of my very first visits there, actually. Um, so uh, no, this was with my just with my five hundred. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and in fact, the owners of the property don't actually know a lot about peregrine falcons. They knew they were there. Uh, they've been really pleased to see my photos, to see them up close and to learn about their behaviour. Um, so it's been a real, it's been a two-way relationship with the owners of the property. I've been able to teach them about their birds and they've been absolutely fascinated. And of course, I get the benefit of having access to their property. So it's been good. Which is... Uh one of the reasons that I'm so interested in sharing about photography, um, even though I'm an absolute rank beginner, is that it has a really important communicative value to help bring other people, uh, outs outsiders for want of a better term, the uneducated, the uninitiated, the uninitiated into the world of, of birds. Now, this is one of the offspring that you uh, mentioned from last mm -hmm. season. Is that right, mm -hmm. Sandy? Yes. Um, yep. Have you got any idea if it's still uh, within the parents' territory or is it gone? No. I think, well, as we know, I think they chase the young away once they're independent. Uh, so the last time I went there, which was quite some time ago, there was only the two adults there. So they would have either gone off and found their own territory or there's a, a lot of them don't survive. So there's a high, um, you know, mortality rate with, with young peregrines. So hopefully he's happy and off somewhere else. Yeah, uh, yeah, I hope so. <clears throat> uh, or he or she, I don't think we mm. were able to sense right. that one. No. Uh, staked out its own claim and found, mm. found a mate and, uh, and he's getting busy. Man, yes. Getting yeah. Jiggy, getting jiggy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, that's what my camera trap may make it. I know where the peregrines like to hang out. I know what their favourite little perching spots are in the quarry. So my aim is to get up there and set up the camera so I get one of those spots and we may get some X-rated photos. <laughs> I'll just take this opportunity to say hello and welcome to everyone that's um, watching live. Uh, you can comment, you can ask a question, you can say anything you like, and as long as it's uh, not not too outlandish, I'll uh, put it up and we'll talk about it. Sandy, this is a shot of yours I really I really like, just basically because I really like Crimson Chats. Yeah. Uh, uh, tell us the bit of the story on this shot. They're awesome birds, aren't they? And they're birds we don't see um, in this spot this was a few years ago it was drought times and we had a lot of birds coming down much further south than they normally would and i'm sure it's due to the drought they were looking for food and water and places to breed so uh i got a tip off from a bird a friend that there were 
these crimson chats on a particular dirt road up near Balaclava. So I went out to find them and I, I visited them a few times. And on one of my visits, uh, I noticed that they were collecting food and flying into a little low shrub on the side of this dirt road. Um, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Maybe they've got babies. So when they went off looking for food, I quickly walked up to the bush and parted the leaves and I looked in and there was a nest with two little black wriggly babies in there. And, oh, wow, it's amazing. So I didn't stay long. I backed away and left the birds in peace. Um, but it was such a vulnerable position, this little shrub right on the very side of the road. It would, be, would have been so easy for a car or a farmer's tractor to run over that spot. I'd also seen a cat and a fox in that area. So, so incredibly vulnerable. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it was nice to watch the birds coming in and feeding their young. But I chose not to take a photo of the babies very deliberately. I, I just didn't want to disturb. I didn't want to upset the parents for a start. And I didn't want to disturb the babies. I didn't want to bring any attention to the babies from any cats or foxes that might have been around. Um, yeah, I just I just felt it was better just for me to enjoy that really brief experience and just leave them in peace. So sometimes you've got to put the welfare of the birds ahead of your desire to get that photo. Can you remember what you were using? Was this on with the long lens or was this with the standard, you, um, standard that that would have been with my 400 prime lens and my 7d mark ii so fantastic and these um, are it doesn't show it there but these are super tiny birds they're really really tiny but the the coloring is brilliant so uh, we we often in this area we often get white fronted chats and orange chats uh red chats are uh, scarlet chats are really uncommon. Yeah. Uh, Nico, you would have seen the crimson chat in your um, forays into the drier parts of Australia, I, I, I assume. Yeah, I've seen crimson chats before, but I've never gotten uh, a photo of them. But I've seen these absolutely stunning birds. Mm. I, I love their behaviours. Um, that They're quite similar with the white-fronted chat in the way they um, go about their their business and if you are lucky enough to find a small group and watch them for a while they're uh, they're really intriguing uh, they're a bit like the the chuffs i reckon when you you're watching a group and the the dynamics um so that's why i i chose this one sandy i really want you to tell us about this next one i know that you are into <laughs> budgie, budgie butts <laughs> That's actually the desktop on my computer at the moment. Uh, yeah, uh, this was another case. About the same time as the Crimson Chat, we had budgies coming down quite close to Adelaide. So this was uh, up near Roseworthy, which isn't too far away. Um, and uh, I was, I, I had a few visits there. We, the budgies were hanging around. And on this one particular day, I was just madly shooting trying to get shots and when I was reviewing my shots I nearly sort of deleted this one thinking oh that's terrible but then I took another look and I said you know it has got some redeeming qualities and it's actually one of my all-time favorites um I call it budgie butts uh because the budgies come into this sheep trough to have a quick drink and you've got to be so quick they just move so quickly they come and have a drink and they're gone uh, but I quite like this one. Now, the next one is one that you got a lot of um, comments and positive feedback for, and it's sort of, I'm going to treat this as the first one of a pair, Sandy. Uh, Nick, you may have seen this before. Sandy, tell us about this yeah. shot. That's my Galatri in full bloom. I was coming back from a day of birding up at Mount Bryan East. It was very late in the day and I thought I was done for the day. I was heading home. 
and then I, a huge flock of galahs flew across the car in front of me and landed in this dead tree. Uh, so I thought, oh, what are my chances? I thought, this is not going to be good. The sun was setting. Um, I was losing the light. Uh, but I thought, I'll give it a go. Um, there were actually power lines in the way, but I managed to crop those out. Um, but as it turned out, it was one of my better shots. People just really love this. And it does look like, like blossoms on a tree, doesn't it? It's got a, an artistic quality. Yeah. When you were framing the shot, um, did you have that in mind or were you just taking yeah. a bunch of pictures mm. of birds? I, I could see the potential, but I thought the light was against me. I didn't think I could get it to work. So consequently, it's a really high ISO. It's a fairly grainy shot technically, but I don't know. It doesn't seem to matter. I was able to do a bit of work to bring it up to an okay sort of a standard. Uh, but, yes, I could see the potential when I was standing there taking the shot, um, and it did turn out quite well. And as you say, people have just loved it. I want to break there for a minute to talk about uh, not so much the pushing the ISO because it's really difficult to talk the technical stuff um, in this kind of format. But you, you said before about the budgie pick that you were going through reviewing your picks and you nearly deleted it. Now, I, I, I would normally just, I'd back up everything, right? All the raw stuff. And then I would have a working lot of pictures that I wanted to um, edit play around with later on i wouldn't delete i i'm i try not to delete anything when it comes to images just in case just in case one day you might want to do something now sandy you mentioned you're a beginner the post pro the post processing part of photography is a whole other field yeah. that you need to learn and get confident with so yes it, it's half of the magic honestly and I have a bit of an advantage because for a large part of my life, I was working in the print and publishing industry. So I have, as a typesetter and graphic artist, so I was familiar, I have been familiar with Photoshop for a long time. Uh, so that hasn't been such an issue for me. I'm also, um, because of my graphic arts background, uh, you know, I know about design, I know it looks good. So, you know, the rule of thirds and all of that, it sort of comes naturally to me, I guess. Um, that is certainly half of, half of the, the magic. Um, and I spend a lot of time on the post-processing. Like you, I'm a bit of a hoarder. When I'm out in the field, I don't have a lot of time for picking and choosing photos. So I will typically back up everything and back it up onto my laptop and onto a portable hard drive minimum. Um, but, uh, yeah, so you keep everything just in case. Um, and, and what doesn't work can go on the crap bird photography Facebook group. <laughs> That's right. How about you, Nico? Do you, um, are you ruthless in the first cull or do you back up everything and then do a selective sort of thin out for what you think you might work on um both i'm ruthless because you you just i think you you have to be uh or it becomes unmanageable but i do the same so my workflow is usually and uh, let's say i go on a i go on a shoot somewhere and that that applies to sort of both my 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 passion shoots and my professional shoots but um at the end of the day i'm done with the day i back up everything on, on double backup, everything, regardless of uh, there's no culling happening, just everything's backed up. And then I, I finish the trip. I have this, this, um, these two things, these two drives. And then so I, I'll start working on the, on the working drive. And as I'm doing that, I update the backup with the change that in the main one. And so basically, um, it will mirror the change I'm making. And as I'm deleting on the, on the new one, 
it gets also deleted. So I, in the end, my my backup will will only be like a copy, uh, like an exact copy of what I kept as well, because because it becomes it, it becomes very difficult, uh, especially when you start uh, having like um, well a, a large body of work and doing it for a long time. I recently went through the process because if I I didn't do that for like a, a few trips um, over the past sort of four years, but recently I moved all my files into one unified system and I did. I spent about three weeks uh, full time just <laughs> culling culling things because I was like, I don't, I want to start clean. I do not want to have excess files that, that are like that are not because I became better at doing it later. But I've I've started the my my new system starts in two thousand and nine, and anything two thousand nine to now I have in that in that server, and uh, so I didn't want from from those first years. I see there were some sort of fairly large amount of things that were like not needed. So I went through that culling process, like retrospectively. Um, can you remember how many terabytes of stuff you had, uh, and how much how much you have now? Uh, yeah, right now, currently, well, I think I have twenty nine terabytes of uh, mm -hmm. of uh, current files, and um, I probably culled a solid mm, five terabytes, I would say, because the the, the videos uh, amount as well. It's it's a, it's mostly yeah. videos like the. Mm -hmm. The, the my my space requirements have grown exponentially since I moved more into a professional video than uh, than stills. Sandy, do you know how much how much storage space you've taken up? I have got so many portable hard drives, including a remote one that lives at my daughter's house, just in case. But I reckon I can fill up a four terabyte hard drive in maybe eighteen months. I reckon that's a pretty long time myself. You reckon? <laughs> but I don't. I don't do a lot of video, given that. Yep. I suppose I'm. I'm putting the um, all the audio backups on on as well. But I I fly through. I, yeah. I fly through two terabyte drives like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. I'm, I'm now. I'm now thinking about you. You Nick. You said you filled up the server. Have you got a separate external server? Right, it, apart from this one is uh this this one i have 40 terabytes on there so i have another another um another 11 terabytes free on that one yeah and and sorry if you sorry we're away from photography a little bit but it is an essential it's part of, of i often i get a lot of questions during like during uh wildlife photography workshops and things very like very often the question of workflow comes up because yeah people are curious about how to how mm. to store the photos how to to work through them do you keep the original here or that there's a lot of mm. questions about that because there is a lot of information out there but it's easy to get lost because it is it is easy to have a lot of images and um and yeah. so yeah it's very it's a very common question that I, that i get so so nico do you use like a a raid array or have you got something like a, no i've went a, the cheap a, the cheap a, way a nas a mm. network attached story storage or it's network attached you... but uh, i i work on it in um in a way which is called it's so it's a lot of those things you can buy, like the casing with the different bays and thing. You yeah. can select which type of red you want, what sort of redundancy yeah. go from. Yeah. The best one would be where half you literally lose half yeah. of your data storage, but it's all backup. But, but it's because all backup I'm on the other half, yeah, exactly. So, but so I'm, the, in, I would feel like I'm very diligent. Example, yeah, mm. just so people know how we're talking about, that could be one cabinet where you would have eight hard drives in it, but mm -hmm. four of them are mirroring the other four. Other so four, so you lose. Four fail. You've got it. Um, yeah. Now, now, most people would also need to have an off-site storage. Mm. So that would be something like uh, a, a, a out of the box network attached storage or something where maybe this is how you've got it with your with your daughter Sandy, where you where mm. over the internet it backs up to that. Apart from if you've got any in the cloud, because of course you can lose stuff which someone else controls in the cloud. Yeah. I don't use the cloud at all because, you know, we're in Australia, uh, the internet exactly. is slow. It's, mm -hmm. it's just not an option and our files are yeah. so huge. It would take forever. So I just don't bother with the cloud. It's just not worthwhile. Yeah, oh, well, it's, now it's, that it's, it's not practical in Australia. No, yeah. no. 
So now that I've covered that, let's go back to birds. Ah, the odd one out. Yeah, what uh, um, I think you called this, there's one in every crowd, I think. Yes, this has been extremely popular and it has actually been stolen. So I've had a few fights with legal departments around the world to get it removed. People started sharing it without my name. I don't mind people sharing my stuff, but I want to be credited for it. So I had a few battles which I won because I could prove this was my shot. But, yeah, I knew when I was taking this what what it would end up as, um, and I think it speaks to being the odd one out, this row of galahs. This was on a dirt road north of Balaclava in the uh, mid-north of South Australia. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, it, I love it. Can we... I'll leave the image up. Can we talk about that issue and... Maybe, Nico, you might have some examples of this too, where where people are nicking your stuff and passing it off as being theirs, or if they're a resharing kind of uh, website, uh, 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 they accumulate other people's work and then for, uh, for clicks they get it out there and they profit off it that way. How, do you, how did you get to prove this was yours, Sandy? Do you keep your location services on and all of that well, metadata <clears throat> attached to every shot? It was extremely easy. I contacted legal departments of places like Reddit and I was able to direct them to uh, the image on Flickr. And, of course, Flickr's got all the information there. The, what is it, EXIF information? EXIF data. Yeah, EXIF data. Yeah, yeah, EXIF data. And uh, you just got to scroll down to see the serial number of the camera um, and the date. And, yeah, so um, it was clearly my photo and they didn't question it at all. They just immediately removed the photo. Well, within, within a week it took them to remove the photo. Did, did they remove the offending person's account? No, no, no they that's, didn't. That's what they need to do to stop yes. this happening. I mean, I'm... I'm sure I reshare stuff on Twitter inadvertently not knowing that it, who that it is a stolen image but I, I clearly I clearly want to say if I if anyone ever notices that I've done that tell me and I'll not mm. only delete it I'll bloody report and block the account that I shared it from because look it's really not hard to credit the photographer uh, I'm in a habit of not sharing any photo unless I know what the, who the photographer is. Um, and, of course, you know, this is my art. Uh, I put a lot of time and effort and money into getting shots like this and it's just all I ask is to have my name attached to it. So, hmm. Have you been the victim of pirates, Nico? Very often, yeah, very, very often. And it's always the same. There, so there is a lot... They're not easy to find those systems to to request removal and things like that, but they they exist on all platforms. And I've helped a lot of friends showing them where to go on Instagram, for example. There is a very mm -hmm. straightforward process where you're like, you click on this, you're like, yep, I want to report this. This is my photo, and all they ask is the link to the original, um, or any proof that you have it's the original. Link to the offending image. Usually within a within a few days, it's deleted on the other person's account. They're pretty yeah. pretty good with that. <laughs> Uh, it's the same um, same system on Twitter, same system on TikTok. I've done it on several uh, on all platforms. Uh, YouTube pushes it even further. Has a great feature where um, it will it it will always it, sort of they, they have an AI it. bot. It yeah. finds it and I receive emails. And several times I've had people download my wildlife uh, my wildlife videos and re-upload it with like as theirs, changing everything, putting their name on it. And, uh, and in that case, YouTube's out. You have two options. You can either, because YouTube recognizes it's yours, it's your content. And um, YouTube is like, we have two things. We can either send them, you, you tell them uh, they have seven days to take the content down yeah. and then they don't get a strike against their, against their accounts. Or you can have it removed straight away and they get a strike against their accounts. Um, and uh, usually it's depending, yeah, it's gonna be depend on the situation, what I do. But um, yeah, it happens a fair bit, a fair bit on YouTube. Like things where people complete take your whole contact. Like, I've had complete full videos taken, 
and then re-upload it on accounts. And as you say, those accounts that make money selling merchandise, make money like in, in various ways. You know, it's, it's a completely different discussion when someone approaches you the proper way and say, we'd like, this is a great clip. We would like to use it for this and that. And uh, like often the, the answer is no. And you were talking about all those like sharing accounts uh, on, um, on, uh, on Instagram and things. And I'm, I guess I feel like I'm a bit different than a lot of my friends uh, photography friends and things like that. I have a have a pretty much like a ninety nine no policy. I never tag hubs like bird hubs, feature hubs, things like that because basically those things do nothing for the creator. Absolutely nothing. They might get you like the especially in the the how Instagram is built these days and how it works. Um, it just does nothing. It, all it does is re removing you one step further because a lot of people will share from those hubs we, and then the credit gets lost, the, everything gets cropped. And, um, you know, it, it might sound like I've had a lot of discussion about it. it, might sound like petty or anything, but it just brings absolutely nothing both to the bird, to the world, to the, to the, to the conservation because most of these hubs never really grab your mm -hmm. caption or do anything. They just like, look pretty pink bird in flight uh, comment mm. what you think about the color pink and that's all to get engagement and then like a little bit down the track they're like oh look we have some merch to sell or we have this and mm. that and <laughs> to me it does nothing so i constantly say no to the point i've been blocked by a lot of uh, a lot of um, hubs in australia not by being mean or anything just by every time they shared i was like hey i didn't give you permission to share also often it's very disrespectful they don't even follow you they don't they don't mm. really they don't follow your work they're not invested just mm. see the photo and uh, just take it and uh, and share it and uh, and even mm. if it's properly like uh, uh, sort of credited which is very rarely done it's usually your credit will be buried in between 50 hashtags so no one can ever see mm. and no one ever looks at this so to me there is no point uh, of being featured on those uh, on those hubs at all besides if some people enjoy seeing their work on there and getting extra a few extra likes and and things it, I wouldn't care less about being on the on those things. I really select carefully who I let um, use my photos, and it's often people that I um, I either have a working relationship with or I can trust um, where how the message is is put across. But yeah, uh, hubs and shit. That's a really um, fraught sort of concept too, isn't it? About value, who gets who gets the value. Um, from my standpoint, where I am trying to um, create value is to amplify the, conf the conservation message mm -hmm. and the educative message. Um, Sandy, I guess yours is probably a little bit more in the artistic and the um, self-help's not the right word, but the, <laughs> you know, fe fe feeling good about, uh, uh, about the world around us. Also education. Yeah. And uh, Nick, yours is, I mean, this is your livelihood. So you, mm. you have as well you have turf, turf you need to stake out and protect uh, as well. As, as, as well, but it, it's a lot of, again, it's a lot about that, uh, that what we're talking about and same that uh, the Sandy was just saying, it's about, to me, it's about keeping the, the, the messaging, like uh, the, the message, the caption original the content if the if the if a hub is there solely for the the purpose of like you know sharing nice image that we used to write you know information conservation message something that actually um like proactively can do something um that that's fine but like the 99 percent of the time that's not um that's not the case and people don't understand what the copyright laws are they really do not understand it at all mm. uh and if i do complain on Twitter about what's happened. Uh, every time I'll get people saying, well, it's your own fault for not putting a watermark on. They don't understand that a watermark offers you no extra legal protection. Watermarks can be removed. I don't yeah. personally like watermarks. I think they interfere with the artistic uh, the image. Um, and so I end up in this debate with people about using watermarks or not, and it's, it's victim blaming. Uh, nobody has the right to take a photographer's photo and use it however they wish. No, um, and it's, it's, it's not my fault that they've taken it. And, and I might point out too, I, I made this point in our discussion last time, uh, Nico, but just so Sandy is aware, all the overlays here, unless they've got the black border on the, on the side, 
I've had to crop in a way to fit the aspect ratio for this particular format. So some of these photos are a little bit different than the way Sandy originally cropped them. Yep. Now, I'm, I'm trying as much as I can not to make any artistic um, interpretation, but there is a compromise that is made to fit them into this aspect ratio. So I just wanted to point that out so that people might look at your, your one, Sandy, uh, from your feed or in your Flickr and go, oh, they're a bit different. What have you done? Well, that's why <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't try to interfere because then it's not my work, right? Mm. I mean, this is, uh, and this says it down there. It says whose work it is. Mm. <laughs> so, um, Sandy, let's do a couple of parrots before we talk about two pictures that are a bit different to your regular run of the uh well run of the mills the wrong term because none of your photography is run <laughs> but your your <clears throat> your regular fare um let's talk about two parrots let's talk about this one the beautiful regent parrot uh they're just a stunning bird this is either a female or a young bird i'm not sure which uh but i had heard tales of a large flock of regent parrots up at glue pot at a particular bird hide so uh, the next weekend I jumped in my little car and it's really not suitable for taking to glue pot, but it's been there three or four times now. And I went up there and I got up at, I don't know, four o'clock in the morning and did the long walk into the this bird hide so I could be there at dawn and to wait and hope that the regent parrots came in. Uh, and I got some beautiful shots of lots of different birds, uh, including, uh, and there were, there were about 30 regent parrots that came in and spent some time around this particular water point. And it was just such a beautiful morning. And I had the place to myself. I really like being on my own in the wilderness. It's it, it's special to me. Uh, and I just had the best time. Um, these are lovely birds. Um, of course, closely related to the superb parrot and the mm. princess <laughs> parrot. Um, marvellous looking birds. I I would guess, I'm thinking that that's probably a juvenile and maybe a juvenile female would, would almost be my, would be my guess, but... Um, yeah, she could be right. <clears throat> you, can, you can never be too sure um, judging on, on, on the photographs, but uh, if anybody... It's a gorgeous a, photograph. <clears throat> Thanks, Nick. If anybody's an absolute expert on regent parrots, we're happy to be uh, guided on on what we should be looking at to make uh, a, a really, really, really confident identification. Speaking of gorgeous yeah. parrots. <clears throat> yeah. That was from a different visit to Galupot, I believe, if I remember correctly. That's a mulga parrot coming into land. Uh, they are the sweetest little parrots. They're much smaller than the regent parrot, uh, but they have these insane electric colours. Um, they're just remarkable. They're, they're, they're fairly common. They're, they're, you can find them fairly easily here in South Australia. <clears throat> but yeah, all a lovely of, bird. All of that genus are really nice birds. I yeah, beautiful. They're nice birds to see around. Have you, have you got any um, mulga parrot stories, Nico? You, you would have seen many in your travels. Um, yes, I do. Um, I saw some, where was I? I uh, can't really remember, but um, I have a good glue pot story, though. Um. <laughs> well, hold, hold on to that because there's a fair bit of stuff we, we're going to, get into a glue pot in a minute. I just want to talk about okay. two images Mulgers. before we before we get down down there. Yep. Mulgers, maybe Sandy, can you remember what you took uh, this with? That would have been my new setup, my R6 with the 100 to 500 lens. And and was this a um, shoot 2000 uh, shots and pick one? 
<laughs> yeah, pretty much a really high shutter speed uh, to, to try to freeze those wings. Uh, but yes, that's right. Raptors are always popular. Tell us about uh, this old eagle. This guy, um, I think this was a young wedgie. Uh, this was up uh, north of Olympic Dam, up in up near Roxby Downs, up at a really remote spot. Um, <clears throat> they came across this wedge tail eagle and parked a long way from it and gradually walked up to it. And I kept being surprised that it wasn't moving. It just was perfectly happy for me to be there. Sometimes it would stick its leg up and have a little sleep. It was so incredibly relaxed. I was right there in front of it and it wasn't moving. And my camera was getting heavy and I was talking to it saying, are you gonna fly anytime soon? So I got this, I like this shot where it's looking directly at me and it's all fluffy. Um, I call this shot bad hair day. Um, and of course, when it did eventually fly, I got the lovely launch shot that you love to get, the wings totally spread out. Uh, and then it just flew into another low tree not very far away. It, it clearly did not worry about me whatsoever. So I spent about, I reckon, about 45 minutes with this bird. Uh, and that's one of those special moments that will stay with me because that doesn't happen very often. Nick, uh, I always mention that we can anthropomorphise um, images and, and project onto it. But one of the things I like about this one is, as you mentioned, Sandy, he does look quite relaxed, he or she. Um, uh, um, and doesn't have that really threatening, ferocious stare that wedgies so often have when they mm. know they're being um, studied. Um, do you do you get that feeling from this this one, Nick? Yeah, it's a it's more like an inquisitive sort of a, sort of look, and uh, and it's it's young, so it doesn't have that whole like. Um, it has a very different vibe than 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 the adults do. That that stare you're describing is one of the most incredible uh, stare I think you can you can see like it's through binoculars or because they just it's not silly that they they stare like that when you're around, but they have this like powerful stare all the time. They are a powerful bird. They they have this again anthropom anthropomorphizing a lot here, but you just you look at a wedgie and and they look at they just look like they know they own the sky. They know. The, the confidence of the top predator. It's just, yeah, and it's such a gorgeous bird. And the sheer size Sandy, of them. It, yeah, they're, um, it's a bit like your, your leopard that we talked about um, last time, Nick, is it? Not, or, or the rhino. No, no dramas. Mm. Nothing's happening to me, <laughs> fellas. Yeah, it's, it's fine. <laughs> Now, Sandy, most of your pictures are what I would call very naturalistic. There's not an obvious, uh, there's not a lot of obvious editing or effects applied or anything. But w when you told me about this this one coming next, you said you broke all the rules. Yeah. Tell us about this one. I was at a local suburban wetland area and it was late in the day, the sun was setting. And I was looking directly into the sun thinking, I'm just crazy. I'm not going to get any good photos here. So I sat down and felt a bit dejected, but I, I was watching these swans and thinking, you know, maybe I'll try and break the rules. I had a little voice in the back of my head saying, break the rules. So uh, I deliberately overexposed everything. Uh, you know, just ramped everything up and I got about three frames like this and it was just amazing. And I've done very little to that. That's pretty much how it came out of the camera. Um, and I was able to blow out that background beautifully uh, and I've since framed that photo and it's now in one of my bedrooms here and I just love it. So it, it goes to show that you can break the rules and it can work. Um, 
and I want to do more of this type of photography. I want to get more artistic with my photos. So I'll be probably trying to break the rules a bit more in future. And Nico, I haven't seen much of your work that has gone down this kind of path. <laughs> do you do you mess around a bit uh, for your own enjoy uh, for your own interest or enjoyment to sort of? Um, oh yeah, some some can... some a lot of like missed slow pans or like slow shutters, trying to get something a bit different. And um, to to the to the listeners, what well, people like looking at the the image now is because it. This this sort of technique that uh, that Sandy did, like it's 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 called high key, and uh, and it's basically yeah you would sort of like overexpose the the the, the surroundings the, the backgrounds and it works really well in this case as well because the bird is complete is black and so it really brings all the detail as well in there has a really good contrast um I do remember I have some um some I did some uh, black and white high key shots of a uh, kookaburra. When I, in Adelaide, actually, when I used to live there, and um, it's uh, it's it's if, I do it sometimes. I haven't. I don't post a lot. I, I think it's it's probably the only black and white photo I've ever posted, maybe in a, in a very very long time, because a lot of yeah, a lot of my work, uh, as I say, it's uh, you know natural history uh, documenting. Maybe maybe I should maybe I should spend more time uh, experimenting, like more posting some of those experiments. Well, that's. That's the point, isn't it? It takes a lot of time mm. to do it, to learn the techniques um, and to then find something you're happy with. So it's a big investment uh, in in time to go down another artistic route, isn't it? Now, it is, but it, I think it, it, it's, it's always nice to do something, uh, I feel like, to do something uh, a different style like even if it's not necessarily, um, and, uh, and again, that, that's that's my opinion of it. But I feel like there's in any style of photography, you can you can learn something that will be valuable to your current photography. And as we discussed in the previous podcasts, um, I used to photograph concerts when I when I really started shooting for people, so shooting concerts in venues in Paris, and uh, and uh, I've done a lot of studio work, and uh, and I've often like. Just for my own enjoyment, and and as I was like learning more and more, done a lot of things that um, that are completely unrelated to what I do now. But uh, I've learned a lot from this experience, and I, I feel like in in photography and bird photography, you can you can learn from you can learn a lot from that as well. Uh, trying something new, testing a new a new different style, because it will give you a new insight on how light works, movements, sort of like anything. There's always something, and through my through the concert photography, I really learned. Um, how to get the specific exposures in, in in very difficult lighting conditions, which often now I, I apply in the in the rainforest when you have one stream of light coming through the canopy and uh, and lighting that bird, it looks exactly like when you had one strobe of light going uh, to the face of the the person singing or the musician. So there's a lot of parallels you can you can make through that, and uh, and I feel like it's very beneficial, even if you don't end up like sharing any of it really for 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 your own personal growth as a as, as an artist i think it's a it's a it's a good thing to do and you learn a lot from your mistakes too uh, absolutely yeah and that's one thing that social media doesn't always show is how many <laughs> yeah. how many how many mistakes and how many hours and how many missed things yeah. um uh, yeah. uh, happens for you to be able to curate that 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 feed exactly now we're going to look at a, a, a few images that are quite different to your usual fare, Sandy, and then then a few more birds. Then I teased everyone that we were going to do feelings. Then we get into the feelings. So, so just stick about. Um, where was this, Sandy? That was at one of my favourite beach spots, Bald Hill Beach near Port Wakefield. Uh, that's a bar-tailed godwit, uh, one of my favourite shorebirds. Uh, they're just amazing. They travel to Siberia from here every year to breed and come back again. And I really enjoy spending time with them. We don't, oh, we have a few overwintering at the moment, but most of them are still in the Northern Hemisphere, but they'll be coming back, oh, 
about September, I should think. Um, so I'll be back at Bald Hill Beach once they start arriving and the other shorebirds that are migrating. Um, but these are great. They're really hard to get close to. And this is, again, where my two times extender comes in handy, although I didn't have it for this particular shot. Uh, but they're fascinating birds. If, if you want, look, look them up if you're out there and don't know much about these birds. Do a Google search on them. They are just the most fascinating birds. I've been at Bald Hill Beach when they're just about ready to depart in March and I've watched them getting ready to for their big trip and they fly, they do like flight training up and down the beach in formation. It's just amazing to see. And I, I think about, that. yeah, there you go. <laughs> and I think about their big journey ahead and I, you know, you know, you know, maybe some aren't going to make it. Will they come back? Um, and it just boggles my mind uh, what what they can do. Now, I will probably add to the web post for this episode, Sandy, some of those animated um, gifs of the migration for some mm. of the godwits. Um, I don't know if I've got access to any for the southern hemisphere, but certainly the amazing distances that they, both the Northern Hemisphere birds and the Southern Hemisphere birds traverse. There's yeah. <clears throat> some great tracking um, uh, animations out there. So I'll try and yeah. some of them. And an interesting thing about these birds is those, those jaunty bills of those, the curved bills, they can actually move them. I actually got a photo of them with the, with the tip upturned and I thought, oh, what's going on there? And then I found out that it's something they do. They're actually flexible. They don't look like they're flexible, but, but they are. And if you're interested in shorebirds and the great migratory journeys, uh, on the podcast, I've done Toby Ross, um, Amanda Lilliman. Uh, we've done all the curlews. Uh, so there's plenty to, uh, to chase up if you're interested in uh, migratory birds and the amazing journeys that they do, and especially the tales about how much they have to eat to be able mm. to do the journey. Uh, and uh, yeah, they're just just staggering. Again, that's another uh, tale about not disturbing the birds when they're about ready to leave. You need to keep your distance from them because they're trying to fatten up. They're trying. They're madly trying to eat, and you shouldn't really be chasing them chasing them around the beach at that point in time because they really do need to conserve their energy for their big flight. We certainly talked about that with Amanda Lilliman talking about the curlews at Dar Darwin Harbour and mm. and how you needed to, to leave them be. Uh, just on, on these shots of the, uh, of the Godwits, Sandy, um, you said you didn't have your extender with you, but did you take these with the the massive telephoto or with... I, I actually think the one before wasn't with the extender because that's a fairly old photo, yep. But that one, I think I did have the extender on for that one. That's a fairly recent photo. That was probably from, oh, probably February this year. Okay, just having a look. We've got another... Uh, um, okay, we, we, uh, I'll just mark that comment and we'll get back we'll come back to that i think when we're talking a bit more about the about feelings um i'm i'm i have some ideas about kangaroo island but uh actually let's just raise this one are we all worried about traveling again now that we've got these massive waves of covid again happening all around the world yeah i am i'm <coughs> I suffer from anxiety, so COVID is like the perfect storm for me. Um, I'm 60. I'm no spring chicken anymore. Uh, and I just want everything to settle down before I consider any long trips again. Um, I had a, had a disastrous trip over Easter. I had to attend a funeral in Queensland and they lost my bag. And so... Um, that's enough to put me off as well. So, Which we've um, been following on. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, you, you, you finally got a win with. I did get a win. But I did get a win. 
But let's talk about that when we get back into the feelings part. Yeah. Uh, Nico, are you worried? Because I know you've got some um, some things slated, some some trips to undertake later in the year. Are you worried now that there seems to be evidence that these latest variations of uh, evading the vaccines and causing illness in in people who a few months ago we were all really confident wouldn't get seriously ill yeah absolutely and it's on on like on and in the on the whole like spectrum of things you know like where it like health wise um i caught covid uh, maybe a month and a half ago and it was absolutely not a fun experience at all and um and uh, and yeah like but, uh, it, just in the logistics of things because because uh, as part of like work we do travel uh, a fair bit and uh and uh yes i am like to, to make it short yes i'm worried there's so many like different topics that it, that it affects that we didn't think of like right now that whole that whole like luggage issue around the world like with people like having like luggage lost luggage uh, blocked all the time um, it's that's why i highly recommend anyone to put uh, uh trackers in their luggage yeah. it makes things super easy like a like an air tag or a tile it's uh, it's saved a lot of my friends uh, putting that in their in their pelican case because if if the airline is like we don't know where it is you look at your phone you're like i know where it is it's in that pile. they're like oh yeah there he is under the pile of luggage it's really a, it's it's a it's it's a big thing but yeah i am very worried and i always i try a lot when i know i have a job coming up where i have to go somewhere i will i will be i will be a hermit uh, even more than usual for the mm. for the the week or the 10 days leading to that and really keep my uh, my outings to to a minimum in terms of like going to like a, a densely populated place and things because it's uh i don't want to catch COVID again it really wasn't fun at all but also i don't want to jeopardize its work i don't want to be i don't want to jeopardize uh, you know I arrive on location and be like sorry i can't do anything or this or that yeah it's uh it's tricky yeah, I'm certainly. Um, I mean, this whole time I've stopped going and seeing people. I just mm. I go to the supermarket when it as soon as it opens, so that mm. there's the absolute bare minimum of people uh, there. So that reduces your chances. But um, I think we've all got to start modifying our behaviours again, or else we're all going to be really stuck in this loop that just keeps mm. going and going. All right. Oh, on the luggage, have you seen the pictures that were circulating yesterday of that amazing pile of baggage that's still stuck at Heathrow? Like, it yeah. it doesn't mm -hmm. seem to have, have reduced at all in two no, weeks. It's insane. Like, a, it like a, it's a small thing. If you have to travel and have things in check-in, put a tracker into it. I think it's worth the price of admission just for that tip. So, uh, especially mm. your professional, your gear that is your professional yeah. um, livelihood relies on it. So, yeah, certainly. Absolutely. And and I would, like I've always said as well in the previous one, yeah, I always travel with enough in my carry-on to be able to do the work, um, mm. to be able to like, because it, it's most of the time, like it's more like the expedition documentary type stuff. So I don't need to have the long lens uh, with me. And, but I need everything. I need like the main body, a lens, an audio kit, just everything that I could, and uh, like at a yeah, at a minimum, do the job without any of my luggage arriving. Sort of stuff. It's a, it's a yeah, it's a good advice. Even if you're going on a holiday somewhere, having having um, for a shoe for like a you know a birding trip or for the birding trip or anything, having um, a setup where you can have everything you need. That is like necessary in the in there, and I've also had like a lot of um, yeah, most of my gear was stolen out of uh, checking luggage, so I'm avoiding that as much as possible. Yeah, when I had my bag lost, a lot of people said, "Well, why didn't you just take carry on?" Well, they don't understand when mm. you've got gear <laughs> yeah. to take. My backpack is full of my laptop, my long lens, uh, my camera, what I need to just get by. I'm not I'm not checking that. So <clears throat> never. I just have never. to. Yeah, I, I saw something yesterday where somebody was talking about um, the the compromises you have to make, and then I thought about the way that I travel, and I always thought that I was a freak. That when I go 
somewhere. This is generally if I'm going into Southeast Asia, as anyone who knows me well knows. I love going to the Philippines and um, got piles of friends over there. And because I'm generally going to be staying with people, with you know families or something, is generally how I, I travel. I take the important things, like you just mentioned, Sandy, laptop. Sometimes, last time I went, I took a mixing desk and um, a whole lot of other audio kind of gear. And I take the shoes that I want because they're hard to replace over there. And then I take what I'm wearing. And then when I get there, I go and I buy some secondhand clothes. Mm. And so I don't have to worry about... uh, stuff getting lost and I always thought I'm, I, I must be the I, n- I never saw any only business people doing the commutey kind of flight who would just walk off with what they've got you know a backpack and and that's it I hate carousels I never trusted it to start with and now now I think maybe I'm doing it the right way um, yeah. because it, it, I, I would do it differently if I was going on a round the world trip or something and it was going to go to hot place cold place hot place cold place do meetings and all that mm. that's different but that's not how i ever ever travel i can get away with two pairs of shorts some t-shirts a hat and boots uh sand shoes and a and some flip-flops you know that's like so apart from toiletries personal gear and and then the the audio and photography kind of gear and the computer mm. and some way to make sure you can access the internet they're the things that, that you need i don't yeah. I, but again my framing's different too in, in everything i don't care i i have a son who lives in seattle in america and i'm keen to go and visit him uh but i think it'll be probably this time next year at least before i get over there yeah i've put off i was hoping to do a trip in october november but i've completely put this year yeah. out of the frame yeah um i'll 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 do something do something locally instead and there was a question there was a question from stan earlier about kangaroo island and that's i was supposed to go to kangaroo island to celebrate my 60th birthday last year but of course COVID was raging things are really uncertain so that didn't happen and then it was supposed to happen this year um and uh again we're just we're just not sure um so may, maybe it'll be next year, but I do plan to get to Kangaroo Island sometime soon and do some birding over there. Me too. Now, I'm going to bring up two birds that I particularly love. So, Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> My spotted pardalotes. Uh This was when I was... It was the time when I met those lovely people with the peregrine falcons at um, Spring Gully Conservation Park. Uh, I was sitting, I'd I'd hiked through to this particular point to position myself at a dead tree where I knew the peregrine falcons liked to roost sometime. So I sat there for a long time, maybe an hour, had my settings all ready for the peregrines and I heard a bit of activity over to my left and I quickly swung around, and there were these two little spotted pardalotes collecting nesting material. So it was, um, I didn't get my peregrines, but I got these, and they're just such beautiful little birds. And I like that they're actually doing something. It's actually interesting. Yeah, that's that's what I, I like. And, and I can't think of many photos of pardalotes that aren't at the burrow entrance or the hollow entrance where I've seen more than one bird in in, in a good shot. Uh, can you think of many, Nick? Uh, not with both, no. No, usually yeah, it's it's, uh, it's it's usually like a, a sole bird. They're such gorgeous little things as well. They're so loud and so mm. small. Mm. It's incredible that something so small has a like such a loud little call. Mm. Can you remember what you took the shot with, Sandy? That's my new, yeah, that was my new, uh, actually, I've got to think back now. That was about, that was about this time last year, in fact. So it would have been my 7D Mark II 
with my new 100 to 500 lens on board, I think. Cool. Now, another one of my favourite birds, which I have only very rarely seen out in the wild. They're not... They're not common on this this side of the divide. Diamond firetail, Sam. Yeah, this was at the beach. This was this was one of those days. You know how you get a little checklist when you're going somewhere and you think, oh, I want to get this bird and I want to get this bird. Well, I had about four birds that I hoped to see when I was over on over near Port Lincoln. So I got a few tips about where these birds hung out, and it was a, one of those really weird days where. You just go tick, 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 and your list gets checked off all within the space of a couple of hours. So I went to Louth Bay and I got some osprey shots and then I headed to Punindi and got some Cape Barren geese shots and then I headed to Point Boston. Uh, people had told me that these birds were there and, yep, there they were. And you've got the lovely ocean in the background, so... That was really nice. Um, they're sort of, they sort of look like they're dressed up to go to a formal dinner or something, don't they? All in their, their fancy formal. The background, gear. the background colours here really complement um, with the yeah. with the bird. It's really really nicely balanced. It's gorgeous, and it's a gorgeous bird. I've only ever seen once in Adelaide. Okay, yeah, they're lovely. Love those. Mm. Sandy, you just said that you sometimes go out with a list of what you want to um, secure. The shots you want to get, the, the species you want to get on the day. Now, is that your your normal modus operandi? No. <clears throat> uh, it's just a little mental wish list and it rarely, it rarely plays out like that where I'm successful. Uh, if I'm going to a spot like that, like Port Lincoln, it's a it's a really long drive. I sort of do a bit of research to find out what I'm likely to see over there. Um, so, yeah, I just had it in my mind about the birds I might see. And you, you know that you're lucky even to get one on your list. Uh, but the fact that I ticked four off on the one day was exceptional. I don't often go out looking for specific birds because uh, you're often disappointed when you do that. Um, I, I mean, I did go to Gluepot to look for the Regent parrots because I knew they were there and that, that paid off. Uh, but really, most of the time, I'm out there uh, and just whatever the universe gives me, I'll take photos of. How about you, Nick? When you're not, when you're not working uh, on, a, on a project, but when you're out on your home patch and you, you've got your camera and you're going to take some photos for pleasure... Have you got targets in mind? Have you got a, have you got a, Sometimes. a list, whether it's mental or? Sometimes uh, it's it's um it's it's a bit it's a bit of both. Sometimes I'll be like, I know there is this in this area. I'll go and have a look, and um and, and spend time on that. Or uh, sometimes it's just um it's literally whatever will come my way. Um, I don't even go with any expectations of like mammals. That's especially especially true for my my local urban park, which I spend a lot of time at. Um, especially in the past sort of six months, it's a, it's quite a large park, has different habitats in it, and I absolutely love walking through it. And some days, it's literally just this. Um, we're talking about like therapy before. It's this thing where it just it just changes everything, no matter how like crap my day was or if I just spend the whole day at the computer or something I just grab the camera and walk around and, and see what I can find and sometimes I'm come home with zero photo nothing that I might have sh like five like five or six images but just don't keep anything and sometimes I come home with great images because of what I encountered so I think there's a, there's a lot of benefits as well to, to just being being happy to be surprised about but out there, so it's, yeah, I don't. It's I would say fifty-fifty. Sometimes I know what I want, and I will go to specific area for it. But I, I, I really enjoy the, the just just the walking around and then and, and see what's what's about. Now we hadn't planned this, but you mentioned therapy. Um, I promised that we were going to get to the feelings bit. Uh, uh -huh. Andy, just. It, it, 
it's really up. Uh, it's really for you to sort of free reign now, because I want I want you to talk about what photography means to you. This image is really poignant. It's it's at Gluepot. Yes. So <clears throat> tell us tell us about this. Uh, this was the time where I got the Regent parrots, but half of the reason. Half of the reason I was there was because I'd just split from my uh, seven-year relationship and I was quite depressed and upset and I know that getting out birding makes me feel better. Uh, so I heard about the Regent Parrots, jumped in my car and drove to Gluepot and I slept in my little car, uh, very basic, very uncomfortable, uh, this shot was not set up in any way. I actually had a call of nature and went off and I looked back and thought, oh, that might make a good shot. So I went back and got the camera and just took a few shots of that. And I really like it because there I am. All I'm, I had the place to myself. There was nobody within miles of me. And uh, it was it was really nice. Uh, so I settled down in that car and had a very <laughs> uncomfortable night's sleep before getting up at four o'clock and setting off for uh, the long walk to the bird hide to see the Regent parrots. Uh, but that's what I do. Um, people ask me sometimes, aren't you scared being on your own? And I said, no, I love it because the bush there actually talks to you. It When you're on your own and you listen carefully, you hear the wind through the she-oaks and it makes this beautiful noise. It almost sounds like a person talking. And I really like that being on my own. And you have the beautiful sky as well. The night sky is just amazing. So uh, this is what I do to make myself feel better. Uh, my psychologist said that I'm really lucky that I know what helps because she counsels many people who never, never have that. They don't, they don't have anything that makes them feel good. She said, all you need to do is grab your camera and jump in your car and go out bush and you know that makes you feel better. And she's right. Um, I do have that strategy. Um, so now I'm just waiting for a four-wheel drive to be delivered, which I've had on order since March so I can get back to the remote places that really make me happy. Sandy, the, the breakup of a significant relationship that's been so long and, and a part of it, um, from what I can gather from following you on, on social media, that was really important, apart from the personal relationship, was that you had access to that four wheel drive. Yes. And it was, that vehicle was like a big part of your um, weekend identity, I guess, for getting oh, out and going places. Um, exactly. The places I go are quite difficult to get to quite often. Uh, and my partner had a, a Triton that I used to drive quite a bit to get to these places. We also had a little tiny caravan that I loved. Well, that's all gone now. I don't have access to that. Um, so one of the first things I did was order myself a four-wheel drive, even though it's taking all of my savings, so there's there's no safety net anymore. I knew it was absolutely critical for me to have that. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I've bitten the bullet. I'm getting a four-wheel drive. When it gets here, I'm going to take some courses. I'm going to learn how to use it, drive it, get myself out of trouble, lower the tyre pressures, change a tyre, do all of that uh, because, uh, you know, I, I have to be independent. I am i don't want to have to rely on on, on, a, on a guy anymore to do that for me. Um, so, yeah, there you have it. I'm an independent woman. Nico, do you, do you ever find the birding and the photographer, and, and let's extend it for your stuff because it's wildlife in, in, in general and, and, and the landscapes, is a large part of why you are passionate about photography 
rooted in a sense of well-being by being out in the elements? Um, I would I would say so. There there is there's there's multiple studies that show the the health benefits of being in nature, you know, lowering blood pressure and just making it like it just does does wonders to to that and 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 yeah i would say this it is it's it's a huge part of why i enjoy it so much because um the, i don't think i've ever been more relaxed and happy and and at peace if you want than than when i'm yeah, in a in a remote place with just nature sounds and um and and out in sort of like i would say that the, the middle of nowhere it doesn't even have to be the middle of nowhere like i said my urban park walking through the walking through the the Melaleuca swamps um like bird calls, bird, like sound, nature sounds around. It's just that there is this this calming uh, effect that is really hard to explain why, but it just happens. And uh, and and I'm lucky that it's mixed with for me nature also equates to nature photography, and it's this outlet where I, I go out and and I really you become more curious curious about your surroundings. You you sort of become more observant. You discover a lot of things and. And through all of that, it's 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 some it's a part of it that I absolutely yeah absolutely enjoy, and I know for a fact it does absolute wonders to how I feel on a on a day to day basis. And having access and and doing that, and like I said, it can be very remote places. It can just be the the, the local park because we're very lucky in Australia that we have so much wildlife. Even in in urban settings, we have an incredible bird life, and. Um, yeah. Uh, so to answer your question, yes, absolutely. It's a big part of why I enjoy it so much. It's it's the it's how it makes me feel, and then which is like very very good. I agree with everything you've just said, there, Nico. I find that when you're out, you're using all of your senses. You're listening mm. and you're looking, and you're really in tune with nature i can't understand these people who go to these parks and they've got earphones listening to music i think they're missing <laughs> they're missing the point because there's so much to listen to and absolutely heart- and, and that's what i always yeah. say it's just it's a, if you like if you like nature and birds and, and things you will never get bored like sometimes mm. it might just be you have a layover somewhere for like a few mm. hours you can go to a park and discover something like completely completely new it's it really brings out the the, the, there's new things you start noticing new animals new new just little changes it's uh it's it, it's um it's great and when you're out there trying to get the shot you're not thinking about what mm. bills need paying or or work or no. anything else and I often, you you got hyper focused yeah and I, and I often get because you you just mentioned getting the shots i often have people that that you know tell me oh like you know, like you, you, you're behind the camera, like you're not enjoying the moment or anything. And uh, and I always like highly like uh, disagree with that because it's um it, there's, there's a few things that's coming in uh, into play. Like so, as you said, part of the, the, the being in, in nature and feeling that 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 like that nature therapy is uh is great. And then I, I add that that photo element. But the the fact is that um. It's that's why I always tell people that like uh, that say that it's about um, it comes down to like knowing the equipment as well a lot so that I don't fight it because I've been doing it for so long everything is second nature to me I'm not here looking at an animal and fumbling around trying to like do something uh, looking at the screen buttons this and that I have it in the viewfinder and I know exactly what I'm doing I don't need to put the camera away I know where everything is in my and so that 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 specific fact makes it that I very rarely feel that missing the moments because I am able to 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 capture it while enjoying it and that's I think that's something that you you get to when you reach a certain like technical level because then you have the creativity on top of that 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 is like a that has like no sort of a uh, limit how how far you can learn and do but i mean the technical thing once you master that specific gear it's not in your way anymore it's you know if you if you take photos you're like oh why is it blurry or what is that what's what's iso again if you get to that point because if you like it so much you get to that point where it's second nature all those things it's the, you don't even have to like think twice about them they just come naturally to you then you enjoy what's uh, what's going on and you you don't really feel like you would be missing what's going on. But sometimes, sometimes as well, when it's something that 
um, I've put down the camera and uh, you know it, I'll get the photo I want and then just put it down and, and, and watch or through just sometimes I just take my binoculars as well no camera and I just go around and but that's usually when I see really 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 cool stuff but that's another another <laughs> story yeah when you see really really good stuff uh, your heart rate goes a million miles an hour and you tend to shake so part of that is trying to control the, control your heart rate, your breathing, mm -hmm. and you're shaking. So you get the shot because you're going to mess up the shot if you shake too much. So uh, I think there's there's a lot to what you're saying about um, control, you know, controlling your senses uh, to get to get that shot. Yes. And uh, it's, uh, as you said, like you, your heart starts racing and so it doesn't mm. matter. I keep on banging about like urban parks because I, I do spend a lot of time in that park uh, mm. lately, but it's a, uh, it's uh, like my heart races. Even if you see like a common species do something that you've never seen before or something mm. exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, very recently, I filmed a, 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 a koala jump from one branch to another. And I've never seen a koala leap that far in my life. And I was ecstatic just watching that koala uh, do that. Or a few days ago, um, there's a, uh, um, I caught up with a young photographer that, that, that I've met a few weeks ago in the, in the park here, and he does photography as well. Uh, and um, we were, so we saw each other, and then I stopped to photograph a swamp wallaby. He continued with his dad, and then he called me saying, oh, uh, we just came across uh, an echidna. It's, it's in the open. You should come in and, and photograph it. And it's, uh, it's something that's really, really uncommon in that, in that urban park, an echidna walking around on the Gold Coast. And so I was so excited. It was, a little, it was a little way to go, but it's also a park that a lot of people use to jog or ride their bike, but it would, must have been quite a funny sight because as my heart was racing and here I am running with my big tripod, the big lens, the camera, the <laughs> bag, and I, and I overtook someone who was jogging and I was just literally passing because I'm like, <laughs> I heard there's an echidna, I'm on a mission. And I just like running up. So it was it was just this, this funny moment of yeah, excitement. And again, it's one of the things it, it's, you get yeah. I feel like you get the th you get the therapy through the calmness and uh, and all those sounds, but you, I think you also get this this excitement, but but like I would say healthy excitement mm -hmm. instead of like having mm -hmm. this this sort of like short burst of like uh, dopamine brought to you by like social media and the, your little screen, you get those uh, those actually like really organic um sort of e exciting moment where you're like your brain is happy and uh mm -hmm. for a completely different like reason and i feel like it's sort of like the the natural like way of uh, of um getting excited and yeah it's uh, it just works so wonderfully and i can really relate to what you're saying as well the being out there and i'm, I'm really excited uh, for you to, to get back on the on the road with your four-wheel drive mm -hmm. and uh, and see where you take that you have done another perfect segue lead in for my next uh sort of question nick um you're welcome about about social media and the endorphins and the the the, the rush and the positive affirmation that you can get often in discussions nowadays that's talked about in a negative way but sandy i'm getting the uh, impression from watching your maybe your last year on Twitter, um, that Twitter has been a bit of a safe space and a positive environment for you and building community and getting support um, basically through sharing your photography. Mm. So we've only got a few minutes left. And so if anyone in the audience wants to make a comment or ask something, now is the time to do it. But Sandy, do you want to talk about your relationship with social media? Yeah, Twitter's a strange beast because there's a lot of really terrible people there who seem to be there only to cause trouble. Mm. But, you know, there's some really good people there and I've made some really true, real friendships through Twitter. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, people seem to look for my photos as something positive on Twitter. Uh, and they seem to appreciate that. So I'm happy to add some balance because Twitter is full of politics and news and bad news and there's so much bad stuff in the world right now. And, you know, I get dragged into that too. I get dragged into politics and that sometimes too. But I try to pull myself back and say, no, let's get back to my core mission, which is to share the photos 
Um, and yeah, I've got I've got people um, who I've met in real life who've become really good friends through Twitter. Uh, yeah, but it's a strange beast. You really have to spend a lot of time understanding how Twitter works, and you have to use the mute button and the block button. Um, and realise that some of the com some of the comments are coming from robots. They're not actually real real people. Sure. And, and and you have to not give a shit a lot of times. Like yeah, that's right. Like when people have a crack at you or something, it's like oh well, good. I go and have a look, and they got twenty one followers. You know. Yes. And they've got and they've got a cartoon yeah. character as a uh, yeah. You know, and 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 I just picture them sitting in their underpants in in grandma's basement. You know. Yeah, going. Eh, I'm really upset. That's <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. It's always... Well, look, I like to, I like to think of myself as helping in this time of terrible anxiety, and particularly during the time when people were in lockdown. Here in South Australia, we weren't we didn't have a lot of lockdown issues, so I was still able to get out and do my birding locally. Uh, and I think, you know, all those people stuck in their homes and their apartments really liked that uh, yeah, I could share my my experiences, yeah. How do you find uh, social media, Nico? Like you're, you're not a, a, a heavy user of it, but uh, well, certainly not a heavy poster. But mm. are you a big consumer of, of any of the social uh, media probably. platforms? Probably. Probably more than I should. That's what I'm saying. So, uh, the, the, there was a, there's a difference between what I what, when I was mentioning about the the like how I mentioned social media before and then what we talk about how like Sandy like uh, uses it. But I, I was more thinking of like your classic um, s scrolling for the sake of like scrolling through, which I, I do sometimes. I have to like uh, I have a few apps on my phone that try to reduce the amount of like time I spent on on platforms because it's a yeah it's it's this addictive thing where you, and then it can bring in can, and social media can bring the good and can bring the bad like Sandy said um, I've made incredible connections that I would have that would have never happened beforehand um, through through social media like people that are now some of like my best friends or that I've been on trip with or just someone that's that we've like had this this connection for, for something and just through social media so it's been great but it's also um there is a very like sort of dark there are several dark aspects to 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 these and um and um yeah that's why i don't post a huge amount but i do spend a fair bit of time on them for work as well like it's it's part of uh, it's part of some of the projects i do so i have to be on and i, and I try and actively be aware of uh, of uh, of sort of my my um my mental health and take breaks when uh when needed but uh, yeah just it's it can be it, it's it's it can be great and it can be terrible it's that's that's how i would define it yeah thick thick skin don't give a shit that's the way yeah. I, I go with it well we've got we've got to the end um just before i wrap up sandy those people in the park um with their headphones on they're listening to the back catalogue of the bird emergency. <laughs> which, well, that's okay. That's okay then. <laughs> which, of course, you can find. There's, uh, geez, we're so close to a hundred bloody episodes up and out there. So, um, uh, if you're into birds, go back listen. If you're into photography, go back and look at the previous photography Fridays. Nick was the last one. I don't know who's next, um, but I'll promote that on Twitter. That's where I do most of the promoting. Larako, Nicholas Rakatapore, what's your what's the best social for you, Nick? Uh, at Larako, uh, basically on uh, on Instagram. That's where, uh, like, when I sh when I do share share there, I do share as well on on Twitter uh, at le underscore Rako. The Rako was taken, but those two or my website Larako .net, That's where all the uh, most of the things are. You mentioned uh, Amanda Lilliman before and the Far Eastern Curlews, and uh, it's a great great podcast by uh, grant i would recommend and if you look her up as well and uh, you click on a video there is a good video showcasing her work on faris and curlew and uh, and her partnership with the larakia indigenous rangers around darwin um which uh, which uh, i've made so a little plug here but uh yeah there is a there is it was great working with amanda learning about the faris and curlew and seeing how the Larakia Rangers are working and, and, and sort of documenting and following up what's happening with the birds. 
And how's that? After all that time, when I spoke to Amanda, and that's quite a few years ago now, I had no idea you were involved in that project. You know? I, so, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a small word, sort of like when you look at conservation and like media around conservation in Australia. But yeah, I did. A, I spent a few days in Darwin uh, interviewing Amanda, and uh, we went out with the the rangers one time. Um, yeah, just making the usual short videos I used to make for the Threatened Species Recovery Hub. And uh, there is one on the on the website, on the YouTube. And it was fascinating. That's what I love about that, uh, that, that work is I get to learn and be creative at the same time. From memory, you have to go all the way back to episode number two. It's either two or three of the bird emergency to, to get Amanda's episode. Uh, Sandy, I... Mm -hmm. You've got a you've got a sixty one on your Twitter handle, so I'm just going to leave that put that in the in the link. Are you doing uh, Instagram and Facebook as well? Yeah, I do both. Yeah. Okay, I'll put both the links in uh, in there. Uh, Nick's is easy because it's on the screen. Uh, anyone can see how to spell it. Uh, Sandy, thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, it's been a long time in development to get uh, Sandy on the. Uh, on the screen and, and having a uh, having a chat. Um, I'm really looking forward to what you do next now that you got the or you'll have the new vehicle and where you'll be going out. And gee, hopefully one day, one day we'll all get in the same uh, location and yeah. um, and I can put some of my crappy bird picks up against your excellent bird <laughs> picks. And, I actually um, I actually have met Nico before. I'm mm -hmm, sure we have. Yep. A shore bird workshop, and the funny story about that is uh, an osprey flew over, and I was the only one at that shore bird work workshop that got the photos of the osprey because mm -hmm. everyone else was down on their bellies looking at the shorebirds, and I just happened to look up and see the osprey fly over, and I got the shots. That was so, in 2018, I believe. Uh, yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Early Long 2018. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and... Well, you know, Sandy, you've been taking these bird shots for eight odd years now. Um, now, do, do you want me to share your Flickr album on the on the web page, or I, I don't mind. You can if okay. you want. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I will do that because there are so many. I mean, there's over three hundred <laughs> just in your parrots. Folk. Yeah. Um, so yeah, do do um, do take that opportunity up and and go through, yeah. and you will uh, as. As I did, I'm sure you will find a lot of the joy that Sandy gets from photography just bursting out. Landscapes and street stuff and a whole lot of stuff as well. So that's great. Um, thanks again, Nico. I don't know when we're going to do it again, but we are going to do it again. We are, so. absolutely. Anytime um, we can. Uh, Sandy, maybe you'll want to join us again when we maybe put someone else under the microscope uh, um, <laughs> yeah that's, look. That, that's kind of the format i'm the rank outsider i like to get some experienced people in and then get a newcomer in and we'll go yeah. through you know in depth uh, their, uh, yeah look I, I find this quite terrifying i'm much more comfortable on the other side of the camera i I'm pretty good at it <laughs> yeah it's not my favourite thing to do, but, yeah, I'll, I'll help out if you need me. Well, thanks for sharing. Um, thanks for being involved. On the other side of the screen, the, the watchers and, and listeners on all the formats today, thanks for being involved. Thanks for commenting. I'm Grant Williams. I'm a bird nerd. That's Sandy Horn. She's an excellent amateur photographer and... He's Nicholas Ragatapore, and he is a professional photographer and a scientist. There we go. I got that in for you, Nick. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. See ya. Bye. Bye.